thank you for joining us um, for the first of uh, today's workshops, Deadly Connections, Challenging Nuclear Weapons, Nuclear Power, and Climate Change. I am Sophia Woolman from the American Friends Service Committee. Thank you for the reminder. Um, and during this morning's workshop, um, we're going to be, like the uh, title suggests, uh, exploring the connections between nuclear weapons, nuclear pow power, and climate change. As these are um, two of the existential um, threats facing humanity and our planet. They are human um, created, but uh, with human ingenuity and commitment, um, they can be also overcome um, by humans and, and more uh, precisely probably by the power of the people. Um, so we'll be exploring the direct ecological impacts and threats of uh, nuclear technology and climate change, as well as the systemic and systematic connections, the economic um, importance of these issues, the political role um, that they play uh, in military tensions, um, as well as the uh, economic systems that uh, benefit uh, directly um, from, from these destructive forces that so threaten um, humanity and our ways of life. So beginning with uh, Jackie Cabasso. Um, Jackie has been executive director for the Western, of the uh, Western States Legal Foundation since 1984. She's been involved in nuclear disarmament, peace, and environmental uh, advocacy at the local, national, and international levels for over 30 years, and is a leading uh, adv advocate and voice for nuclear abolition. She was a founding mother of Abolition 2000, um, the, the global network to eliminate nuclear weapons uh, back in 1995. And since 2007, she has served as the North American Coordinator for, of Mayors for Peace. Um, she also serves as national co-convener uh, for the United for Peace and Justice and convenes its nuclear disarmament and redefining security working groups. She is a co-author of Nuclear Disorder um, or Cooperative Security, U.S. Weapons of Terror, the Global Pro Proliferation Crisis and Paths to Peace, um, and the co-author of Risking Peace, Why We Sat in the Road. Um, which is an account of the huge 1983 nonviolent protest at the Livermore <coughs> Nuclear Weapons Lab and the subsequent mass trial conducted by Western States Legal Foundation. Um, she has been arrested uh, more than 50 times for active non acts of nonviolent direct action, um, which shows her incredible commitment to these causes. And she received the IPB's 2008 Sean McBride uh, Peace Award and the Agape Foundation's 2009 Enduring <coughs> Visionary Prize. So welcome to all of you. Thank you all so much for being here for your work. And let's begin. Thank you, Sophia. And thanks to everyone for coming. You had a lot of choices to make in this very uh, packed time convergence. And we're very pleased that you decided to join us. So I'll get right to it. I'm going to sort of do the Nukes 101, just to lay some groundwork for the speakers who are going to follow. In January of this year, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists and, and uh, Science and Security Board wrote to UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and the members of the UN Security Council warning that its doomsday clock now stands at five minutes to midnight, <coughs> primarily due to the twin existential threats posed by nuclear weapons and climate change. Both stem from the same roots. If you care about nuclear weapons, you should care about climate change. And conversely, if you care about climate change, you should care about nuclear weapons. <laughs> With conflicts raging around the world and the post-World War II order crumbling, we are now standing on the precipice of a new era of great power wars. The potential for wars among nations possessing nuclear weapons are growing. And some nations are starting to make the role of nuclear weapons more central in their national security policies. When the Cold War ended, Everybody around the planet, I think, breathed a collective sigh of relief, feeling that they had escaped the possibility of global thermonuclear war and forgetting about nuclear weapons. Unfortunately, the nuclear weapons establishments in the most powerful states quickly regrouped, came up with new justifications for maintaining nuclear weapons, and the enterprise continued. Today, two and a half decades later, an estimated 16,300 nuclear weapons, most held by the US and Russia, pose an intolerable threat to humanity due to the ever-present pres potential for use, whether intentional, accidental, or due to miscalculations. The International Committee of the Red Cross has warned that incalculable human suffering would result from any use of nuclear weapons, and that there could be no adequate humanitarian response. 
Despite the 45-year-old commitment enshrined in Article 6 of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation <coughs> Treaty, there are no nuclear disarmament negotiations on the horizon. While over the past three years there has been a market uptick in nuclear disarmament initiatives by governments not possessing nuclear weapons, both within and outside the United Nations, the U.S. has been notably missing in action at best and dismissive or obstructive at worst. Nuclear armed countries are spending over $100 billion a year on nuclear weapons and related costs. These expenditures are expected to grow as nuclear weapon states undertake ambitious programs to modernize their warheads and delivery systems. As currently planned, maintaining and modernizing the U.S. nuclear arsenal and the infrastructures to support it will exceed $1 trillion over the next 30 years. Put another way, every hour the U.S. spends almost $2 million on nuclear weapons, and by 2030 it will be spending nearly $4 million an hour on nuclear weapons and missiles. The U.S. government is officially committed to modernizing its nuclear bombs and warheads, the submarines, missiles, and aircraft that carry them, and the laboratories and plants that design, maintain, and manufacture nuclear weapons. U.S. policy and budget documents all manifest an intent to keep thousands of nuclear weapons in active service for the foreseeable future, together with the capacity to bring stored weapons into service and to design and manufacture new weapons should they be desired. Russia's nuclear weapons programs and policies closely mirror those of the U.S. and are also reflected in the, in the other nuclear weapons possessing states. The Cold War and post-Cold War approach to disarmament was quantitative, based mainly on bringing down the insanely huge Cold War stockpile numbers, presumably en route to zero. Now disarmament has been turned on its head. By pruning away the grotesque Cold War excesses, nuclear disarmament has, for all practical purposes, come to mean fewer but newer nuclear weapons, with an emphasis on huge long-term investments in nuclear weapons infrastructures and qualitative improvements in the weapons themselves projected for decades to come. Nuclear weapons do not exist in isolation. Newly elected anti-war candidate Barack Obama, if you remember that candidate, on the eve of his swearing in as President of the United States declared, Going forward, we'll continue to make the investments necessary to strengthen our military and increase our ground forces to defeat the threats of the 21st century. Hundreds of thousands of active duty troops and U.S. military personnel are deployed in approximately 150 countries around the world. In 2012, the U.S. spent as much on its military as the next 11 countries combined, $682 billion, more than two and a half times more than China and Russia combined. The U.S. military dominates the globe through its operation of 10 unified combatant commands, overseeing a network of more than 1,000 foreign bases in at least 130 countries. Global operations are coordinated by United States Strategic Command, or STRATCOM, headquartered in Omaha, Nebraska, which is in charge of U.S. nuclear war planning. Nuclear weapons, still at the core of STRATCOM's mission, exist within this system of military, extended military bases and unified combatant commands. Nuclear weapons remain central to the national security policy of the nuclear armed states and their allies who shelter under the nuclear umbrella. As calculated by Randy Rydell, senior political officer of the United Nations Office of Disarmament Affairs, over half the world's population lives in countries whose national security policies explicitly depend on nuclear weapons and the doctrine of deterrence, that is, the threatened use of nuclear weapons. So looking at the current conflict between the U.S. slash NATO and Russia over the Ukraine, let's take a look at what NATO policy is. According to the 2010 NATO strategic concept, deterrence based on an appropriate mix of nuclear and conventional capabilities remains a core element of our overall strategy. As long as nuclear weapons exist, NATO will remain a nuclear alliance. The supreme guarantee of the security of the Allies is provided by the strategic nuclear forces of the Alliance, particularly those of the United States, the independent strategic nuclear forces of the United Kingdom and France, which have a deterrent role of their own, contribute to the overall deterrence and security of the Allies. On August 29th, Vladimir Putin said, Moscow doesn't want or intend to wade into any large-scale conflicts. 
But a few breaths later, he said, Russia is strengthening our nuclear deterrence forces and our armed forces, making them more efficient and modernized. I want to remind you that Russia is one of the most powerful nuclear nations. This is a reality, not just words. The final declaration of the recently concluded NATO summit in Wales supports modernization of US nuclear forces based in Europe. And this spring, at the height of tensions over the Ukraine, both the US and Russia conducted nuclear exercises. 69 years ago, the United States unleashed the nuclear age, dropping a single atomic bomb on Hiroshima, which indiscriminately incinerated tens of thousands of children, women, and men in an instant, a tiny and crude nuclear weapon by today's standards, justified by a lie of historic proportions that the bombing ended World War II and saved American lives. Over 90% of the doctors and nurses in Hiroshima were killed or injured by the bomb. Let's, let's talk about what the effects of that bomb were. This is a quote from the mayor of Hiroshima, Ta Takashi Hiraoka, before the International Court of Justice in 1995. The atomic bombs dropped on Hirosh Hiroshima and Nagasaki shattered all war precedent. The mind-numbing damage of these nuclear weapons shook the foundations of human existence. Beneath the atomic bomb's monstrous mushroom cloud, human skin was burned raw. Crying for water, human beings died in desperate agony. With thoughts of these victims as a starting point, it is incumbent upon us to think about the nuclear age and the relationship between human beings and nuclear weapons. The unique characteristics of the atomic bombing was that the enormous destruction was instantaneous and universal. Old, young, male, female, soldier, civilian. The killing was utterly indiscriminate. The entire city was exposed to the compound and devastating effects of thermal rays, shock, wave blast, and radiation. Above all, we must focus on the fact that the human misery caused by the atomic bomb is different from that caused by conventional weapons. Human bodies were burned by the thermal rays and high temperature fires, broken and lacerated by the blasts, and insidiously attacked by radiation. These forms of damage compounded and amplified each other. The bomb reduced Hiroshima to an inhuman state, utterly beyond human ability to express or imagine. So as described by Eric Schlosser, whose recent book, Command and Control Nuclear Weapons, The Damascus Accident and the Illusion of Safety, documents a remarkable number of serious fires, explosions, false attack alerts, and accidentally dropped bombs that have occurred in the US. And he wrote, or he said in an interview, the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima was an incredibly crude and inefficient weapon. When it exploded, about 99% of the uranium that was supposed to undergo this chain reaction didn't. It just blew apart in the air. And a very small percentage, maybe 2% of the fissile material, actually detonated. And most of it became just other radioactive elements. This major city, Hiroshima, was destroyed in an instant. And 80,000 people were killed, and two-thirds of the buildings in this enormous metropolitan area were destroyed instantly because seven-tenths of a gram of uranium-235 became pure energy. To imagine how small an amount that is, seven-tenths of a gram of uranium is about the size of a peppercorn. Seven-tenths of a gram weighs less than a dollar bill. Even though this weapon was unbelievably inefficient and almost 99% of the uranium had nothing to do with the detonation of the destruction of Hiroshima, it was a catastrophic explosion. Nuclear weapons since then have become remarkably efficient and small and capable of destruction that makes Hiroshima seem trivial. Let's look at just what, what one modern nuclear bomb could do. And here I'm citing a study done by our next speaker, Anvi Ramana, in 1999 on the hypothetical bombing of Bombay. And he wrote, based on the available population data, the historical experience of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and different physical models, we have estimated short-term casualties from a hypothetical explosion over Bombay. For a 15 kiloton explosion, and that's about the size of the Hiroshima bomb, the number of deaths would range between 160,000 to 866,000. 
a 150 kiloton weapon, that's a modern weapon, typical. The number of deaths, uh, uh, sorry, uh, a 150 kiloton weapon would cost somewhere between 736,000 and 8,660,000 deaths. In addition, there would be several hundreds of thousands of people who would suffer from injuries or burns. Many of them may die without prompt medical aid, which is quite unlikely. These estimates are conservative, and there are a number of reasons to expect that the actual numbers would be much higher. Further, these estimates do not include the long-term effects like cancers that would afflict thousands of people in the following years of genetic mutations and would affect future generations. All right, I'm going to skip ahead to just some of the deadly connections between nuclear weapons and nuclear power. Nuclear weapons and nuclear power require identical materials and technologies. Their links are technical, environmental, historical, legal, political, and economic. Nuclear weapons and nuclear power share identical technologies and an identical fuel chain, starting with the mining, milling, and enrichment of uranium, fabrication of nuclear fuel, and operation of reactors with deadly byproducts, including long-lived radioactive uh, nuclear waste. Enriched uranium at the front end and reprocessing of spent fuel at the back end can be diverted to nuclear weapons programs. As Fukushima has reminded us yet again, there is nothing good about nuclear power. In addition to the certainty of catastrophic accidents and the resulting massive releases of radiation that do not respect city, state, or national boundaries, there are routine emissions at every step of the nuclear fuel chain, from mining, milling, and enrichment of uranium, to fabrication of nuclear fuel, to daily operation of nuclear power plants, to storage of spent fuel. These releases always endanger public health and safety. Moreover, nuclear power is incredibly expensive and capital intensive and highly centralized. Nuclear power plants take years to build and have limited energy production lifetime before they become too dangerously radioactive to operate. The dangers associated with producing and processing nuclear materials and the extremely sensitive nature of these materials due to their inherently dual use capability necessitate a level of secrecy and security that is fundamentally anti-democratic. Nuclear power benefits that infamous 1% who know that it's such a bad economic gamble that they won't even consider building new plants without federal loan guarantees. And the Price-Anderson Act, which caps the utility's liability for an accident at $10.8 billion. It's actually estimated that a serious nuclear accident could cost as much as $600 billion, the balance of which would likely be paid by taxpayers. And there is no way to safely dispose of or sequester from living things in the environment the highly radioactive spent fuel that remains deadly for more than 100,000 years, the same number of years that the human species as we know it is believed to have existed. The U.S. has, is believed to have more than 77,000 tons of such high level radioactive waste and the amount increases every day any nuclear power plant operates. Nuclear power is not a solution to global warming. And I believe that Raman will talk more about that. The U.S.-Russia conflict over the Ukraine and the China-Japan conflict over the contested Senkaku Dayu Islands, which, in which the U.S. has pledged to support Japan, indicate that a new era of confrontation between nuclear armed powers has begun. And nuclear tensions in the Middle East, Southeast Asia, and on the Korean Peninsula remind us that the potential for nuclear war is ever present. In a time of twin global and economic and environmental crises and growing competition over natural resources, the dangers of even more conflicts among nuclear armed states are increasing. There's good reason to believe that the potential escalation of conflict among nuclear armed states leading to nuclear war is much more likely than the potential use by a state of nuclear weapons, which do not yet exist, or by subnational terrorist groups that do not yet have them. Yet this very real threat is largely dismissed. We can't afford to wait any longer, decades more, for the elimination of nuclear weapons. The Mayor's for Peace 2020 vision is the right vision. In his August 6, 2014 peace declaration, Hiroshima Mayor Kazumi Matsui, President of Mayors for Peace, declared, quote, Each one of us will help determine the future of the human family. 
Please put yourself in the place of the Hibaksha, the A-bomb survivors. Imagine their experiences, including that day from the depths of hell, actually happening to you or someone in your family. To make sure the tragedies of Hiroshima and Nagasaki never happen a third time, let's all communicate, think, and act together with the Hibaksha for a peaceful world without nuclear weapons and without war. We will do our best. Mayors for Peace, now with over 6,200 member cities, will work in conjunction with NGOs and the United Nations to disseminate the facts of the bombings and the message of Hiroshima. We will steadfastly promote the new movement stressing the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons and seeking to outlaw them. We will help to strengthen international public demand for the start of negotiations on a nuclear weapons convention with the goal of total elimination by 2020. And as Rabbi Michael Lerner has said, Martin Luther King did not motivate millions of people by saying, I have a complaint. He had a dream <laughs> and he had a vision. Thank you.